This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Camera rolling and action. Hello everyone, we are here with Bigfoot investigator and television host Pat Pennypincher. Pat, tell us, why did you ask that we meet you all the way out here? It's simple, really. This area has a long history of sightings, reports going back decades. Have you actually seen the beast yourself, Pat? On a monthly basis. A monthly basis? That's incredible. Look, here comes one now. Delivery for Pat Pennypincher. That's me. Thank you. What's that? And why did a mailman just deliver a package to you in the middle of the forest? This is my cryptid crate. It's a monthly box subscription filled with all kinds of Bigfoot-related items. Each month, a new box arrives packed with amazing cryptid-themed items. All I had to do was go to www.cryptidcrate.com to sign up. Wait a minute. Is this the encounter you were describing? Look at this t-shirt. Awesome! I've never read this book before, and it's autographed? Look at this awesome patch. Holy cow, these stickers are amazing! I've been waiting to watch this documentary, and this is the coolest figurine. A Sasquatch watch? All right, cut it, fellas. We're done here. It's even got fur on it. This is unbelievable. And welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well this fine spring day. I have an amazing show lined up for you guys this evening, one filled with a fine array of supernatural stories. But before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that the fun does not stop here. In addition to the free weekly episodes, you can pick up two additional episodes a month, as well as an investigation video featuring me, your fearless guide, all for the low, low price of $4 a month. Just last night, I posted the first episode of April, a two-hour marathon of cryptic conversation with Cryptonaut Podcast's Mark Stores. We covered a few clips previously played on the show and shared a few from Mark's very own website, cryptopia.us. So if you love the show and want more, now is your chance. Simply head over to patreon.com and search for Monsters Among Us Podcast, or follow the link in tonight's show notes. Please remember, however, I truly appreciate each and every one of you, whether you sign up or not. Okay, let's get on with tonight's show. Anyone that's listened to more than a dozen episodes of Monsters Among Us will know that I'm a little bit fascinated by ghost lights, otherwise known as earth lights or spook lights. These tiny glimmers of light that despite showing up in the same place on nearly a nightly basis have thus far escaped the explanation of science. Well, I'm happy to share with you a call that just might touch on these mysterious twinkling lights. This is Carly's call from the state of Arkansas. Hi, Derek. Um, This is Carly from Arkansas. I had called, well, I had emailed in my uh, story about um, a Sasquatch sighting in the backwoods of Arkansas. Um, I'm calling in again. I'm not sure if this was really a ghost sighting or even a weird, it it just seemed weird. Um, I was driving 
um, to my parents' place, and on the side of the road was this really small, um, old cemetery. Um, this town maybe had 37 people in it, um, nowadays, so the cemetery is very small. Anyway, it was night, very clear, um, and this happened about, I think it was back in September, um, but I was heading to my parents' place, and I kind of look over at the cemetery, it's still night, um, and there's these two really soft um, green and blue lights, and they're kind of moving around a little bit, um, up and down, almost looking like they play with each other. When I mean small, I mean, um, think of like a Christmas light kind of size. And so at first, that's exactly what I thought it was. Maybe some Christmas light decoration where only two lights were on, or um, maybe it was like a reflection um, from the light from my headlights. Um, What made me think it was strange was going back the same uh, route that same night still um still very clear and those lights were gone um i didn't really think anything about it until i went back to my parents last night and looked and kind of remembered um that so i'm not sure if that was really anything paranormal or ghosts or anything um but i just thought it was kind of interesting and strange Anyway, I love the podcast. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, Carly. I'll be honest. My first thought that there were simply a few people in the cemetery wearing headlamps. Some of these fancy lamps even have colored filters that you can apply to the light that help preserve your night vision. So the colors weren't even a concern. But as any current or past ghost hunter will tell you, it is illegal to be in a cemetery after dark no matter what your purpose is. Now, of course, that doesn't rule out this possibility. There are lawbreakers everywhere. But it does at least cause us to question that theory. The fact that the encounter took place in the state of Arkansas may be more than just a coincidence. Of the nearly dozen reported spook lights across the country, one of the more famous is Arkansas's own Gurdon Lights. I will let Dennis Farina of the Unsolved Mysteries reboot shed some more light on this subject. Gurdon, Arkansas. One of the many nearly identical towns along the railroad between St. Louis and Dallas. But Gurdon is a little bit different. As darkness falls, the locals anticipate the arrival of their very own unsolved mystery. For decades on the tracks just outside of town, eerie lights have magically appeared. I'd say that I've seen it where I couldn't write it off as being anything else probably 20, 25 times, at least. And I'm a very skeptical person. Over the years, I have personally seen it hundreds of times with my father and my family. I've seen the light at least 60 or 70 times. Uh, And of course, usually when you see it one time in that evening, you can see it several times in succession. What is the Gurdon Light? A natural phenomenon? A long-running prank? Or perhaps something otherworldly? A legend that goes back to the 1930s may explain it. Around midnight on a chilly winter night, section foreman Will McLean confronted one of his workers, Lewis McBride. Got something I need to tell you and I want to doesn't concern any of you boys, now go on, clock out. The day before, a freight train had derailed just outside of Gurdon. This is your last night, McBride. Get your pay, get on out of here. McLean believed that McBride had sabotaged a section of the track. I don't want to hear any more about it. Just pick up your pay and get off the yard. I need this job. Don't. What the hell is the matter with you? When McLean didn't return home, a search party was quickly assembled. They came upon a trail of blood and followed it along the tracks to the edge of town. 
At the end of the trail, they found the lifeless body of Will McLean. By dawn, McBride had confessed to the murder. In February of 1932, he was executed at the state penitentiary. Soon after that, people began seeing the Gurdon light on a regular basis. Local legend said that it was the ghost of Will McLean, doomed to spend eternity walking the tracks with his lantern. One of the first sightings was reported by a conductor named John. When he stepped out of the back of the caboose one night, he was startled by what he saw. They say that John went out on the back platform to investigate, and uh, the light was real far off and kind of faint, but it seemed to be traveling the same speed they were. All of a sudden, it just shot up, and he's just like paralyzed, hanging on to the grab iron and just transfixed, staring right into the light. According to John, the light followed the train for more than a mile. Finally, it veered off in the direction of the cemetery. Ever since, looking for the Gurdon light has become something of a local pastime. If you go down there uh, with some regularity, uh, you're definitely going to see it after a while. Walking down the tracks in the total darkness always left you with a little eerie feeling. I've seen it come on in a quick flash and seen it fade in and then fade back out. The descriptions of the light are quite consistent. It hovers one to three feet above the tracks and is rarely visible for more than 10 seconds at a time. I suggest going to the show notes tab and watching this full video. It's some fascinating stuff. Whatever these things are, I just can't help but to be fascinated by them. Thank you again, Carly, for taking the time to share your call. Up next, we head for the hills of West Virginia to visit with an old friend of the show. The following tale comes to us via Colby, a.k.a. Captain Catfish. Hey, Derek, it's your old buddy Catfish here. I'm calling from Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, I just pulled over from uh, heading home from work, uh, staring at the cemetery. Um, You know, just setting the mood, I guess. Um, Hope all is well in your end. I just want to call in with a story. Um, I totally forgot about this until um, basically just listening to the podcast in general and just kind of refreshing my uh, my memory. Um, so aside from the you know the, the the creepy Jesus figure and the weird synchronicities that I called about before, um, uh, another another thing happened when I was like eight years old. Um, it was right after my parents got divorced, so there's like a lot of um, probably a lot of like negative energy being passed around our, our, our home. Uh, I think people have energy that they kind of exude to begin with. So I do think that can possibly be like a trigger or a, a cause of, of maybe visions or hallucinations or in this case, even sounds. But um, so, so my father was in Vietnam and he brought home a, a music box uh, before my parents even got married. He actually brought it home from my grandmother. And after they got married, um, he gave her the music box. And uh, from the time I was a child, it never worked. Uh, this thing was broken, um, just didn't work. The only, the only way you could get any sound out of it was to manually crank the knob on the back and it would start playing. Um, so, yeah, one day my mom was like, you know, in the bedroom and she was, you know, kind of like upset as, 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 uh, as understandable. Um, she was crying and, you know, praying, and I'm not much of a religious fella, so, uh, you know, I don't know how much of this is related to that, but, um, you know, she was praying to God to give her a sign, um, and this music box started playing, and she basically screamed to me to come into the room, and so I could see it, because obviously it, it scared her, and, uh, yeah, there we go, uh, music box playing, um, played for about 30 seconds, and hasn't played since. Um, I'll actually post a picture of the, of the music box on, uh, the Monsters Among Us Facebook page, if anybody wants to check it out. Um, it's just, it's just an interesting thing I remember, but, yeah, spooky, uh, religious Vietnamese music box story, so. All right, buddy, you have yourself a fine day. Thanks. 
Thank you, Colby. I've posted pictures of the music box in the show notes for tonight's episode, which can be found at monstersamonguspodcast.com forward slash show notes. Now, it's very difficult to make even an educated guess as to why this box decided to play at that moment, other than some paranormal explanation. Now, unless, of course, you're a religious person, then perhaps these events are more miracle-based. I do have one question, however. Does this awesome little music box play any Captain Catfish classics? Thank you again, Colby, for taking the time to share. And just a reminder to everyone else, go to the show notes and click on the link for Captain Catfish. Just trust me on that one. Our next story comes to us from the state of Missouri. This is James's call. Hey Derek, it's James from Kansas City. This happened January 6th, 2018. It was about 11 p.m. I was on my Xbox playing a game when a bright light streaked across my window that faced the backyard. I love horror movies, so what did I do? Yep, I went to see what it was. So I grabbed my coat as it was chilly and out the back door I went. Initially, I didn't see or hear anything. As I walked around to the front of my house, again there was nothing. But just then, a light appeared and was shining down on the trees and the park that was across the street from me. It was the standard bright light, white in color. Honestly, it moved like a spotlight hitting the trees and the ground and even a couple of houses. This light went off and back on every couple minutes. I know the light was coming from some type of object, but somehow it was quiet and blended into the darkness of the night sky up to which it couldn't be seen. Curiosity got the better of me and I had the idea to run in the house and grab my thermal imaging binoculars, so I'm pretty skeptical when it comes to UFOs, the alien kind anyway. Now, what I saw with thermal imaging was strange. It was a helicopter. You could see it clearly, just a helicopter. It didn't seem to be high. Uh, It was just hovering over the park. I watched it for a few minutes, and then with its lights off, uh, it then flew off in a northward direction. Knowing what it was, I could only assume it was military, as there was no noise coming from it, and the color had to be black. The last thing I noticed was as it flew off, it had no other lights, no flashing or safety lights. In a separate sighting in December, I witnessed an airplane. It looked to be the size of a cargo plane, all black, also no lights, and flying as low as I have ever seen a plane fly over the city. Oddly enough, it was quiet also. If I wasn't looking up as it passed, I wouldn't have noticed it. Anyway, love the show, and thanks for your time. Thank you, James. I was recently listening to the Paranoia podcast, and the host, Olav, was talking about a device on some military helicopters that drastically reduced the sound of the engine and the rotors. Apparently, this application is already in use in some military exercises. So perhaps this is what James witnessed that evening. If the craft was searching for someone or something, it may have been beneficial for it to stay as quiet as possible, hence the use of this mechanism. My only other rational guess would be that the helicopter was simply so high that it could not be heard. But it's been my experience that if you can see a helicopter flying, you can also hear it. A higher altitude would also make it difficult for a spotlight to reach the ground with any concentration. So James, you might want to do a search for military bases in your area. Perhaps the explanation is as simple as that. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your experience. Our next story comes to us in the written form. This is Richard's story from Arizona. Hello. I love your podcast and listen to it while working from home. My encounter happened back in the summer of 2006 and I've thought about it quite a bit since. I was working at a local community college and was friendly with all of the members of the campus police force. There was an officer who had moved from another city and he always struck me as odd because he wore his gray hair longer than the other officers and he wore his pants with the legs cut much longer to where they looked like modified bell bottoms. He was always very professional and courteous when we would bump into each other and would make small talk while waiting for our breakfast orders at the cafeteria in the morning. 
He suddenly passed away during our Christmas break in the winter of 2005. It was heartbreaking to come back to work and learn of his passing. For the next few months, I would find myself looking for him on several occasions in the morning while waiting for my breakfast. Time moved on and I no longer thought of him. That is, until June 2006. I had gone to a tobacco shop that was located on our local reservation to purchase some cigars. It was busy that day and there was a line of about 15 people waiting to check out. I had just gotten in line when I looked up and over to my left was this campus police officer with the long hair and the bell bottoms standing in the corner facing the line of customers. I was confused at first, thinking I might have gotten wrong information about his passing, but then remembered that there had been a memorial service at the college. I caught his eye and nodded. He nodded back with a stoic look on his face. I knew something was off kilter when I noticed as each customer paid and turned to leave, they had to pass in front of the officer and were less than six inches away from him. At first I was kind of mad that these people were invading this officer's personal space, until it slowly dawned on me that they couldn't see him. I lowered my gaze and watched him out of the corner of my eye until I reached the counter. I paid the cashier and turned to leave fully expecting to see the officer once more, but he was gone. I simply muttered that I missed seeing him at breakfast and continued on my way. I have professional friends who were employed with the tribe during that time and they were able to examine the tobacco shop's surveillance tapes of that day, and although I was on the tape for the duration of my time in there, the officer was not caught on tape. After all these years, I still don't know why he chose to visit me that day. Thank you for being who you are and doing what you do. Sincerely, Richard, Prescott Valley, Arizona. Thank you, Richard. Something about that story is a little bit touching. Perhaps the gentleman wanted to say hello one last time. Of course, it's also possible that someone that looked a lot like a deceased man just happened to be in the store that day. Then again, if that's the case, why didn't he appear in the security camera footage? What a cool little story. Thanks again, Richard, for taking the time to share it. Next up, we head to the state of North Carolina for a story about a sickening feeling at a hotel. This is Riley's story. Hey Derek, my name is Riley, I'm uh, from North Carolina. Just found the show and uh, decided to go ahead and share one of my stories that I had. So, this took place in the uh, summer of 2016. Me, uh, my brother, and two of our friends were uh, going down to Charlotte for a convention. And uh, we had gotten a hotel room and um, the way this hotel room was set up, there was kind of this main area that had uh, the kitchen with like a coffee maker, microwave, sink, all that good stuff. A uh, couch that was also a sleeper sofa, and then a chair in it. And then there was a door that led to an adjacent room that um, had uh, two twin beds, I think. I was either twin or queen. Um, and then the bathroom was also in there. So uh, they, our friends were paying for the room. So we decided uh, to let them have two beds, and me and my brother were going to uh, share the sleeper sofa. So, um, we, it was a weekend thing, so we were going down on Friday, we were going to stay over Friday night, and then, uh, do Saturday, and then we were just going to come home Saturday night, because nothing on the convention was really going on Sunday that we really cared about. So, um, we get down there, do the convention on Friday, get back to the hotel room, and, uh, we all go, uh, go to sleep, but it was a ridiculously hot summer. And uh, the room was hot, it just, it sucked for me because I run very hot a lot of the time. So um, I just couldn't stand sleeping next to my brother because he was generating body heat or whatever. So I was just ridiculously hot. So I uh, get up off of the sofa, or uh, the sleeper sofa, it's basically a bed. And I uh, decide I'll try to sleep in the chair because maybe it'll be cooler over there. So I get over to the chair and uh, go to sleep. And then during the night, I wake up. And I just have this overwhelming sense of dread, like something horrible is about to happen. And I've never, I never felt anything like that before or since. And so uh, the room was pretty dark, so I'm looking around just trying to see, like, okay, is somebody in here trying to murder us or something? So I'm re- watching uh, the door to the, the door to the room uh, that goes out into the hallway, and then the door to the bedroom, but I don't see anything. And uh, the way this chair was sitting, 
there was um, it's uh, kind of sitting next to a window that would be like back over my right hand shoulder so I look out the window I don't see anything at this point I'm, I'm just really like starting to get super paranoid so um, I had a pocket knife with me so I'm like gripping my pocket knife ready to you know stab someone if they try to break into the room and uh, eventually uh, nothing ever happened uh, I guess I managed to fall back to sleep or whatever woke up the next day and everything was fine so I really don't know what it was could have very easily just been due to being in an unfamiliar place or you know stress anxiety whatever it might be but I uh, just thought I'd share with that uh, thought it was a neat story love the podcast keep up the good work man thank you Riley I usually at least leave the door open to the possibility of the paranormal when analyzing calls but in this particular instance I'm not so sure that is the case I can't begin to tell you how many times I've woke in a strange place with the feeling of panic or dread. Those feelings are only escalated when I'm sleeping uncomfortably, in a chair or in a hot room, for example. So it's my opinion that what Riley experienced, while terrifying, is simply a natural reaction to waking up in a strange place. And then again, I am no expert and could be completely wrong. Either way, I appreciate you taking the time to share your experience, Riley. Explainable or not, I'm sure that it was terrifying. Now our next tale takes us west to the beautiful state of Colorado. This call was submitted anonymously. Hello, Derek. I love the podcast. Uh, I do a lot of driving for work, so I take your show with me everywhere I go. I'm from Grand Junction, Colorado, and I'll just get straight to my story. Uh, So, when my best friend and I were 12 or 13, we decided to go camping in the hills behind his house. He lived on a small mesa overlooking the valley, and it was an amazing place to grow up. Always we walked back in the hills to this old road that was built in the 1800s. It was the original road into the Grand Valley. Most of it was eroded away or overgrown except a spot on the bottom of a draw. It was the perfect place to camp and we had an amazing view of the valley below. We had a great time laughing and talking that night. We turned in around 11 p.m. and I crashed hard. About an hour or two later, I woke from a dream in which a carriage drawn by a flaming horse skeleton with a flaming skeleton rider rode straight through my tent. In my dream, as he passed through, he took my buddy away and disappeared around the bend. I woke up terrified. When I came to, I noticed my buddy was nowhere to be seen. As anyone would, I panicked. And just then, he jumped into the tent and told me to be quiet. He pointed at the hillside through the rain fly, and we could make out what appeared to be hunched over humanoid figures zigzagging all over the hillside. The figures moved around for a few minutes, then suddenly stopped, and we never saw them again. We didn't go back to sleep that night. As we sat there talking the rest of the night, he told me about a weird dream he had that woke him up and shook him. He said he had a dream that an old horse-drawn carriage came out of nowhere and drove right through our tent and took me away. He said it looked like a dusty old man from the 1800s and the horse looked like its skin was a leather stretched across a skeleton of a horse. When he woke up from that dream, he stepped outside to see the figures on the hill. That's when he jumped into the tent. Needless to say, we never went back there. Thank you for letting me share this with you. I haven't really shared that story with anyone before. Thank you, caller. This is truly a scary account. I've had nightmares while camping, and not unlike the previous call, when you awake in the tent, it takes several minutes to collect your composure and calm yourself down. 
so I could see how a simple nightmare could be the issue. However, this is one of those stories that leave me with more questions than answers. For example, where was the tent set up? Could it have been located on an old stage route? Were there ghost stories told that night? If so, did any involve a ghostly stage coach? Did both parties describe the coach and the driver separately, and if so, did the details match? It's questions like these that help determine if what was experienced was a coincidental nightmare or something far more sinister. I'm left with one final question regarding this case. Exactly where was it that the stagecoach driver was planning on taking these scared young men? Thank you again for the call. Alright, I have three more stories to share with you this evening, but before I do, your morning announcements. Get yourself some Monsters Among Us swag. I still have a few decals left in addition to some t-shirts and some koozies, so hit that shop tab on the website and pick up yours today. Also, I'm toying around with the notion of making the theme song available as a ringtone. So if you're interested in picking that up for like a buck, shoot me a message. If I get enough interest, I'll throw that up there as well. And lastly, I always need stories. So if you have a great one you'd like to share, simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Or visit the website at monstersamonguspodcast.com for more submission options. And if you're willing to have your story read as part of the paid content, please just mention that at the beginning of the call. Alright, as promised, back to the action. I often get more than one submission from a single listener. It's something that happens all the time. Typically, I like to break these calls up. I'll play one this week and play another a month or two down the line. But since our next caller included both his stories in a single recording, I've decided just to play it that way. So without further ado, this is Tucker's Call from Vermont. Hi Derek, my name is Tucker. And I actually called in last week uh, twice. The first time being about a UFO that my dad and I saw above our house in Vermont back in 2001. The second time was about what I now know as the Hat Man, thanks to your show. I also posed a most likely impossible question to answer, which was, why do some of us see these strange things and some of us never see anything at all. I wanted to resubmit my stories with a bit more professionalism as the previous submissions were made on my cell phone and in my car during work. Firstly, I'd like to say I love the show. I discovered your podcast only two weeks ago and have listened every day uh, at work through almost the entirety of each day. It also goes without question that your show is probably most likely therapeutic to many of your listeners since so many of us have been living with something that we can't explain. So without further delay, here are my two very different stories. It was 2001 in Wilmington, Vermont. I was 10 years old and my parents had recently gotten a divorce. Twice a month, my parents would set aside one night where my sister and I would have one-on-one time with each parent. During this time, it would be one night, just me and dad, and then the next week, one night, just me and mom. My sister would be with the opposite parent during that one night as well, and the rest of the days during the month, my sister and I would be together for two weeks at mom's, then two weeks at dad's. This night, it was my one-on-one with dad, and we had decided to go to a Chinese buffet then see Jurassic Park 3, because it was theaters, it was in theaters at the time. I remember in the theater running to the bathroom to throw up, which I blamed on the Chinese food, so we decided to leave the theater early and go home. Now, to give a little background of Wilmington, Vermont, Wilmington is a very small, very old, low populated town, hidden within a valley surrounded by mountains in isolation. 
The mountains seemed to roll on and on without any sign of greater populated areas. There was never city lights reflecting the sky, never much noise like that from a highway, and on some nights, stars lit up the night sky with so much clarity you could see the satellites in space as tiny dots moving in uniform motion across the night sky. We lived on the top of a mountain called Hogback Mountain, about 2,400 feet in elevation. The main road went straight across the summit where large, uh, a large gift shop was perched with uh, decks carrying those large 25 cent binocular stands for tourists to see out of, those ones you'd see um, at the top of any sort of uh, uh, scenic view. Near the top, uh, there were many dirt roads that trailed off into low populated streets, maybe one house every 500 feet or more. My dad bought a house immediately after they divorced on one of those streets. It was one of those Swiss chalet styled homes characterized by widely projecting roofs and facades decorated with wooden balconies and carved ornaments around the edges. It was used as an old ski house in the 70s for large groups to stay while vacationing in Vermont. In a nutshell, while living there, I gained some of the best memories from my childhood. Back on topic now, we left the movie theater around 9 o'clock p.m. and headed straight home. The drive took about 25 minutes, so we pulled in around maybe 9.30 p.m. By this time, of course, it was completely night now, and the sky was very clear. We could see all the stars. As we pulled into the long gravel driveway, we noticed some very str- something very strange above our house. My dad and I both stretched forward to look up through the front windshield at what appeared to be a very large, black, triangular-shaped object floating only about 800 feet above the house. Now, I cannot stress enough how enormous this thing was. It took up almost our entire open lawn surrounded the house, uh, which was about half an acre. Although from first glance, one might say the object was triangle shaped. However, from our close view, we could see that the tip of each corner lay flat, technically giving the shape six sides. Uh, The entire object was quite quite flat, Uh, not some upside-down bowl-shaped structure on top of a disc, but flat uh, within enough space for maybe two to three floors within the structure. Picture the type of flatness from the large ship in the movie Independence Day with Will Smith, the one that blew up the White House, uh, but shrunken down to the size of about 20,000 square feet maybe. Triangular, completely black. The bottom looked smooth, with the exception of three black rings about the size of circus circus rings inside all three corners, and some obvious panels that appeared to be door access to mechanical departments for repairs and, and maybe maintenance. That's just my guess. No sound at all was being emitted from this object. Around the edges of the craft were large, bright, bulbous lights lined up like a chain wrapping around the entire thing. There were also red and blue colored lights in the line of white lights in a very clear pattern. Now, I'm calling them lights, but it looked like the lights were shut off. But because of how close it hovered, we could see the bulbs and the matte color around them that would emit bright lights, uh, bright white lights, reds and blues, should the lights be turned on. In other words, I don't think they wanted to be seen. My dad and I stepped out of the car and slowly made our way to the front door. Our front door was raised about 10 feet off the ground and had steps from the driveway that led up the side of the house to the deck where the front door was. Not once did we take our eyes off this object, this this UFO. I remember standing there, staring directly up, holding on to my dad's hand, terrified and motionless. I tried talking, but my dad would quickly shush me as he was trying to listen for any sound coming from this, this, this thing. We stood there for about five minutes or so, 
until the object suddenly and very slowly moved forward. Not up, not sideways, just forward, slowly, with no sound, almost lazily, until we simply could not see it through the dark night sky anymore. We quickly went inside and straight to the computer. At the time, the best we, uh, at the time, the best we had was a good old-fashioned dial-up connection. After only about 10 minutes of searching, we found a website ran by a graphic designer in Vermont who saw the same object only a few months before. The designer created a digital copy of the ship which matched our sighting completely. But since then, the website has disappeared. And I have never been able to find another picture of our sighting. The question is I have is why? Why our house? Why was it surveying the land? Did it notice we weren't home and wanted to learn something? What I do know is I never saw it again. But the memory will forever be engraved in my head as if it were yesterday. My second story revolves around the hat man. I'd first like to point out that I never associated this experience with anything or researched the experience because I had always assumed it was too unique uh, and allowed the excuse of my eyes simply playing tricks on me as a reason to forget about it. That is, until I listened to your show. I saw what may be this hat man twice. Once when I was maybe six years old, and again when I was 12. When I was six, we lived across the street from a cemetery in a very populated neighborhood in the downtown area of a large town in Vermont. A window located on a platform halfway up our stairway gave a view to the entrance of the cemetery. One day, when I was walking about up the stairs, I looked out the window and saw what appeared to be a tall man with a black wide brimmed like cowboy hat and long cloak or trench coat. This man was completely black like black as night, head to toe. There was no distinguishable features. It quite literally looked like a tall, pitch black shadow with very clear, sharp, defined edges, like the shape of a person. The object stood slightly back inside from the entrance of the cemetery and faced my house, motionless. I looked away and then back again and it was still there. Outside was dusk, and there was still enough daylight to see clearly. I went downstairs and walked out on our porch. It was summer, and we kept our front porch storm door open, and only the screen door closed. And I looked out the screen door, and the man was gone. I felt uneasy, but not afraid. If I remember correctly, I simply forgot about it, after a week or two. When I was 12, my mother, sister, two stepbrothers, and stepdad were hiking a particular trail on a mountain I can't remember the name of to train for a summer hike across the Appalachian Trail. Now, we weren't going to hike the entire trail, but uh, we tr wanted to cover most of it. And, and sadly, um, we never actually were able to do it. The first uh, quarter mile of the trail was a wide gravel cover covered path, large enough for ATVs and trucks to go up if needed. Now we've hiked this trail maybe three or four times. It was close to the house and it was a really good training for something like what we were trying to do. On the third time we hiked this trail and had just stepped back onto the gravel path while descending back after a long hike up, I noticed something. It was almost dusk, still plenty of sunlight, and about a hundred feet behind us, up the trail, at the start of the gravel pathway, the same thing I saw when I was six stood there, watching us, or me. 
This time, the object was very close. I could see the body shape, but again, it was completely black, like black hole black, almost drawing in light, devoid of light. I whipped my head all the way around behind me, and he was still there, motionless. Its clothes were not moving, it was not moving. I looked back forward and asked if anyone sees the man behind us. And I was responded with confused, sarcastic no's and you're seeing things. And when I looked back, it was gone. But as I turned my head back around to look back forward, and my eyes naturally saw the woods next to us on the path, as I turned around, there it was again, this time maybe only 20 feet from us, peeking out from behind a tree. We kept walking, and when I looked back again, this time slightly ahead of the tree, and I could see the other side of it, there was nothing there. Now this time seeing him behind the tree, this really scared me. But as I was able to suppress my urges, I kept my mouth shut. My mom very recently confesses she was looking for a man after I asked if anyone had seen anything, thinking there was a real person following us. Since then, I'm 26 now, married, and have a two-year-old son. I have never seen anything like that again. I've never seen a UFO again. I've never seen anything that I would consider supernatural or extraterrestrial. This time, however, should things ever appear again, especially this hat man, I hope, should my nerves be under control, that I can get its attention. I want to know what it is and why it allowed me to see it in the first place. I think I deserve that. Thank you for listening to my stories. And uh, again, I love the show. Keep it going. Thank you, Tucker, for both of those stories. While I find the Hatman story both terrifying and fascinating, I'm going to focus most of my energy on the UFO that Tucker describes. So as most longtime listeners will remember, I've touched on these flying triangles, or wedges, before. There have been several flaps over the years, including Belgium in 1989, Phoenix in 1997, and Southern Illinois in 2000. While in recent years, the veil over this strange craft has been lifted, or has it? Many UFO investigators refer to this craft as the TR-3B, a craft supposedly developed by the United States military. In fact, there is even a patent available, which can be found in tonight's show notes. But more on that in a minute. This craft is said to have began as a concept in 1977, and first hit the skies in the late 80s. It's reportedly nuclear-powered, completely silent, with the ability to hover. Now, back to that patent. Apparently, the patent was applied for and abandoned by the patent office for lack of response by the inventor, a man named John St. Clair. But is that where this theory stops? St. Clair paid hundreds of dollars to process his patent, so why would he be so willing to abandon it? Please do me a favor and slip on your tinfoil hat for this next statement. Is it possible that the patent was abandoned because the U.S. government already created the craft and currently have it in use today? Could this be what Tucker and his father saw that evening? Something tells me we haven't heard the end of these strange, black, triangle, hovering vehicles. So thank you again, Tucker, for taking the time to share both of these amazing stories. Alright, here it is, folks, the final story of the episode. Please welcome Mickey to the show. Hi, my name is Mickey. I'm currently living in Springfield, Oregon. Recently, I discovered your podcast and I've been binge listening and I really love it. Um, I want to tell you something that happened to me when I was a long haul truck driver. It happened on a night in early March of 2011. I'm a female and on this trip, I was solo. I picked up a load of paper out of Lewiston, Idaho. The daytime temperature that day was only about 15 degrees and there was a lot of snow. But it had been a couple of days since it snowed, so the roads were mostly clear. I needed to take the load to Billings, Montana. Normally, I'd have gone through on I-90, 
but I-90 was closed for, for snow, I guess. I don't know. It was closed for some reason. Another trucker there said, oh, just take uh, US-12 to Montana. It's a good road and it's open. So I looked at it on the map and decided to try it. Um, once I got loaded, I went to the truck stop because paper's a really heavy load and I had to weigh the truck. Um, and there I took out my trash and got fuel and weighed the truck. And I also bought some hot wings there to eat later. I started along US-12 at about 3 p.m. Um, it's only two lanes and it's pretty windy. And once I got down into the Loxa River Basin, I think I'm pronouncing that right, the temperature gauge read about five degrees and it was definitely colder. Um, freezing fog had formed and the visibility was getting bad. And on my right was the river. And sometimes my wheels were only two feet from the river. And that was kind of scary because it was a really heavy load and there were cracks on the side of the road and I was afraid that the whole thing was going to collapse and I would go into the river, which would have killed me. Um, the There was steep mountainsides on both sides of the river and one was just right next to the, the other lane of the road going up. And because it was so steep and so far up, um, I couldn't get any signal at all, not on my phone or on the Qualcomm. And the Qualcomm is the, it's like a satellite device that trucking companies use to truck, track their trucks. And I had no signal on it, so I knew nobody knew where I was. Um, so that being said, it was getting dangerous to keep going. And the last car had passed me probably an hour before and it was I was about 30 miles from the last structure I saw which was a ranger station that was closed um, and the road was getting icy so I needed to pull over and I finally found a little pull out by a boat ramp and so I pulled out there and my truck barely fit off the road and uh, but I decided okay this is safe and so I got out and I walked around and checked the truck and it was covered in ice so I know it was heavier than when I weighed it and so I just went in the truck and uh, I shut the curtains to the wind, the windshield curtains. And then I also shut the curtains to the cab to keep it warmer in there. And I, I was idling the truck for warm. And um, about 9 p.m. I got up and I looked at the temperature and it was zero, it said zero degrees, but it was probably more like minus 10 because I was idling in the the sensor is actually in the engine compartment. It's down near the wheel, but it's also, but I was idling, so that's keeping the heat in there. So I figured minus 10 maybe. And um, I just laid down to go to sleep right after I checked the temperature. And I heard rustling in the front of the truck, you know, kind of like a plastic or paper rustling. And immediately, I began to smell something. And I would describe it as a cross between a wet dog, rotting meat, and the worst grocery store dumpster on a hot day you've ever smelled. It was horrible. I got up to look, and I sniffed my trash because I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. But that wasn't it. It kept getting stronger, and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And um, so I sat back down on the bunk, and that kind of shook the truck a little bit because it's air ride. And so immediately when I sat down, something hit the side of my truck right where my head was. I mean, it was like two inches from my head. It sounded like a rock. I jumped and jerked around and another one hit. And I was sure they were making big dents. When the second one hit, I knew what it was. I guarantee it wasn't a bear out there throwing rocks. And then I'm sure a man to be out there in that weather, he'd have to have so much clothing he couldn't lift his arm. I know it was a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or whatever else you call them. Um, I really, really wanted to see it. I was kind of excited, but I was also scared that if I put my head in the window, it would break the glass and I would freeze to death because it was so cold that my shampoo bottle that was touching the side of the heated cab was frozen solid. So I just huddled on the bed and it threw four more rocks, six altogether, and I did count them. <laughs> 
um, gradually the smell dwindled away, but it, it took about 45 minutes because it would get stronger and then weaker and then stronger and weaker, but it, he only threw just the six rocks. And I could just imagine it out there walking around the cab trying to figure out a way in or to get me to leave or I don't know what he wanted. The next morning I stayed in the cab with the curtains closed until the first vehicle passed by on the road, probably about 10 a.m. Then I opened the curtains and waited even longer before I went outside. I didn't find footprints near the cab truck, truck, but um, it was icy and the snow had turned to hard ice. But across the road I saw a couple of places on the on the mountainside where it looked like something had knocked the ice away to the dirt. So there was bare dirt. And, um, but I really, honestly, um, there was nobody around and only a few cars going by now and then. And I really felt vulnerable. And also weirdly, I felt like I was being watched. So I got on the road to Montana, but I have to, give you a little bit further on the story um i have a theory about why he threw the rocks and i don't think it was just to make me leave and here's why remember i first said i heard rustling in the front of the cab well it turns out that at the time all this happened a rat got into my truck and i think i heard the rustling in the bag where i put the bones from the wings i ate and I didn't really discover for sure that he was on the truck for about three days. Then I thought it was only a mouse because he was going under the dash to hide about a quarter inch clearance. And then I just thought a little mouse was going in and out. And when I finally saw him, it was eight days later and he was humongous. He, he was bigger than my tennis shoe. So my theory is as cold as it was, I really think that Bigfoot was chasing that rat to eat. And I think he was mad because the rat climbed up under the idling truck and then chewed his way in. And um, I discovered the hole where he got in. It was in the rubber grommet that covers the gear shift hole that goes from the gear shift down into the engine compartment. And uh, there was a big hole in the back of it. And I think he was hungry and he just really wanted to eat that rat. So that's it. Thanks for the opportunity to share and I hope you can use it. Bye. Thank you so much, Mickey, for the call. You know I do love my Bigfoot stories. I want to start off by saying this. Mickey really knows her stuff. The details she provided were top-notch and extremely helpful. And normally I would have found the lack of track suspect, but she did a decent job of explaining the absence of those as well. The only other piece of information I'd like to have is this. Were there any dents in the truck as a result of the rocks? Perhaps that would be the solid evidence needed to prove that something was outside the truck. Now, since no creature was actually witnessed and no tracks were found, I'm forced to ask this question. Is it at all possible that the large rat that made its way into the truck made all the sounds that were heard? In addition, do rats put off a smell that could explain what was experienced that evening? I have so many questions, but at the end of the day, it's just a great call. Thank you so much, Mickey, for taking the time to submit it. And stay safe during your travels out there. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is given by the talented Warren Pon Abbott and the amazing Addie Lloyd. Music for this episode was provided by Coag, Antitector, Mayu, and Nature World 1986. Thank you all for listening, and until next week. <laughs>